Uh, it is good to be here. Uh, and I'm grateful for the opportunity I have to be able to speak with you from behind this lectern rather than from my house. Uh, the last time I brought a message, it was at home, and then the several times before that, it was based on five things, it was from home, and so it's really good for me at least to have the opportunity to be able to speak to you again from here, from this place. And so uh, I'm really appreciative of that. We're going to pick up a passage today in Revelation. As John is being called up into the spirit, or in spirit, the throne room of heaven. And so what follows is what he sees. So if you were able, let's stand up, respect for the word of God, and we'll be in Revelation chapter 4, verses 6 through 11. Revelation chapter 4, verses 6 through 11. Before the throne there was a sea of glass like crystal. And in the midst of the throne, and around the throne, were four living creatures full of eyes in front and in back. The first living creature was like a lion. The second living creature was like a cat. The third living creature had a face like a man. And the fourth living creature was like a flying eagle. Four living creatures, each having six wings, were full of eyes around and within. And they do not rest day or night, saying, Holy, holy, holy Lord God Almighty, who was and is and is to come. Whenever the living creatures give glory and honor and thanks to him who sits on the throne, who lives forever and ever, the twenty-four elders fall down before him who sits on the throne and worship him who lives forever and ever and cast their crowns before the throne saying, You are worthy, O Lord, to receive glory and honor and power. For you created all things, and by your will they exist and were created. Let's pray. Father God, we thank you for this day. We thank you, Father, for the opportunity that we have to be here today, to be in your house, to be, Father, in your presence with your people. God, impress that upon our hearts exactly where we are and exactly where you are today. Father, I pray that you'll be with each one of us. Help us, Father, to be able to take something from your word today. We ask it in Jesus' name. Amen. You may be seated. So this morning, I want to take a small bite out of a really, really big topic. I want to talk today about worship. My goal this morning is for each one of you to walk away today with a better understanding of what we, you and I, are doing here. Worship is huge, and it really gets at the question of why are we here? Is it for false worship? Are we coming out of a sense of obligation? Well, I'm supposed to come. It is Sunday after all. I guess I should really be here. God did create me. You know, that's a true statement. He did. But if that's the motivation behind why we're here, then sadly, that qualifies as a false worship. Are we coming to keep up appearances? Yeah, I don't really feel like being here today. I'm tired. i got a million things I need to get done. But I know that Jim's going to be here, so I should, I should probably come. Again, that's kind of false worship. That's really not a reason for us to be here. The Bible has a lot to say about false worship. Uh, but that's not what our focus on this morning will be. Uh, rather, we're going to be looking at what worship is. So if that's what we're going to focus on, if that's what our topic today will be, then we should really kind of delve into what actually it is. Now we can always, 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 and I know that 95% of you in this room have done that, we can always consult our good friend, Google. How many of you have consulted Google before? <laughs> Sometimes we get the impression that Google is all-wise and all-knowing, because whatever Google says must be true, because it's on the Internet. And it never lies, right? <laughs> so what does Google have to say about worship? It says it is the feeling or expression of reverence and adoration for a deity. Okay. It's kind of bland. Uh, it really doesn't tell us a whole lot. It's a feeling, an expression, and then a deity. I think we can do a whole lot better than that. In fact, we need to do a whole lot better than that, so sorry, Google. 
What we're going to do is what we should always do. What we should always do is turn to Scripture. That's where the answers are. That's where, that's where all of the answers are. Scripture, so that's what we're going to do today. Now, I want you to understand that as I speak to you today, I am not going to be giving you every single Scripture passage there is on worship. I can't do that, all right? I mean, I guess I could, but you would probably rather that I didn't. Um, so I'm not going to give you everything. It's not going to be exhaustive. But where I am going to go today is where I've been led by the Spirit of God. And so I'm going to see what Scripture has to say about worship, specifically worship for us on this side of the cross. So having said I'm not going to bring everything to you, I do want to challenge you a little bit today. Um, really, I might take it a little bit further than that and, and drop the word challenge and throw a different word out there that's got a little bit more weight to it. I'm going to tell you that I think it may even be your responsibility. I know it's kind of a big word, and most of you go, man, I stopped hearing that word when I was a teenager. And teenagers in the room going, I've never heard that word. Um, but it might be our responsibility to search out the scriptures and see what they have to say. Listen, just because I stand up here and I'm telling you that it's from the word of God and that this is what it says and what it means, should you sit there and just take my word for it? You really shouldn't. I mean, I'm, I'm not telling you right now that I'm up here intentionally digging you down the wrong road. I'm not saying that. But what you need to do is search out the scriptures and see if what is being said is true. Find out for yourself. Don't just take my word or any pastor's word for it. Because we that stand up here are not the final authority. The book the final authority. And so search it out. So that said, I do want to give us some places that we can look in scripture. Some starting places for us to go to. And so let's look at a couple of verses from John's Gospel. Let's look at John chapter 4, verses 23 and 24. John 4, 23 and 24. But the hour is coming, and now it is, when the true worshipers will worship the Father in spirit and truth. For the Father is seeking such to worship Him. God is here, and those who worship Him must worship Him in spirit and truth. It's a lot there. It really is a lot there. Um, and what I want to do is kind of just get down to some real basic stuff here. So the word worship here comes from the Greek prosthenia. So prosthenia. And so not being a scholar of Greek, having never taken a Greek class in my life, I needed to use some resources. And so I did. And I went to a few dictionaries. And so here's what I came up with that I'm going to share with you. Proskuneo is broken down into pros, P-R-O-S, which is towards, and paneo, which is to kiss. So that's kind of an interesting picture, isn't it? Uh, when we consider worship, is that something that's ever kind of crossed your mind coming toward with kiss, uh, with the intention to kiss? So let me help you out with that just a little bit. Picture, then, an old French monarch. I know it's kind of hard to see because the picture is so old, right? An old French monarch from before the days when they were so utterly despised. He is sitting on his throne and a good and loyal subject to the king comes and approaches him, comes towards him to kiss his outstretched ring hand. So what does the picture show? What really is that? Well, it is, number one, showing humility. And one of the things that we need to be able to have when we worship is a spirit of humility. We need to understand who we are and where our place in relationship to Him is. This picture also shows deference and reverence. Now, He is but a mere man, right? He is but a mere man. How much more would this ring true then than our Heavenly Father? How much more would that be? Do you kind of get a picture now, at least in terms of this Greek word of worship? I mean, this idea of humility, this idea of approaching, this idea of deference, this idea of reverence. So that is a really, really good starting 
place for us to look at this idea of worship. As we do that, what we see is that our approach matters. If this idea is coming towards, then our approach matters. We worship him, we prosternate him, we approach him, our Father, with great humility. We read in the opening passage in Revelation about how the elders, the 24 elders, they threw themselves down. They didn't say they gradually took a knee as they were able. Right? They threw themselves down and then they threw their crowns. What a picture. That is what worship is. And that is what it is that I want us to be able to have some beginning understandings about. Let's look at the passage in John one more time. But the hour is coming, and now is, when the true worshipers will worship the Father in spirit and truth. The Father is seeking such to worship Him. God is spirit. And those who worship Him must worship in spirit and truth. So what can we pull from this? What is it from this that we want to use to inform us as we consider worship? Well, there are two things, not surprisingly probably, that I want us to be able to get from this, that I want us to be able to pull out from this. And number one, we must worship Him in spirit. This phrase, worship Him in spirit, is not talking about God as spirit or the Holy Spirit. That God as spirit is later on in this verse. This is about us and how we must worship Him in spirit. This is looking at our inward self. This is looking at our heart. You have likely heard somebody ask somewhere down the line, uh, hey, how are her spirits today? Have you heard something like that before? How are her spirits today? They are asking, how is she doing today? How is her heart today? That's what this idea of spirit is. It's talking about our heart. And I need you to understand something vitally important here. Worship is a heart issue. Worship is a heart issue. Without the heart being right, worship is false. That's kind of a scary statement. But if you stop and consider what we are saying of worship is, if we approach with our heart not right, then our worship is not right either. It's kind of a big deal. So what should the heart be then? What should the condition of our heart be? What should we expect from it? So here's a word that gets thrown out here a lot. Sometimes it gets explained and sometimes it does not get explained. So the word I'm going to throw out right now is, Fear. So is that the first word that you think of when you think of God? I see some yeses and I see some noes. That's kind of what I would expect. All right, so when we throw that word fear out there, what does that word mean? The fear of the Lord. Does it mean that I stand and I, I cower and shake and tremble? That's not what is being implied here. The word fear, as it is used here, is talking about a reverence and awe. I gave a message several years back about that word awe and awesome. It is so overused in our society today. But if you are truly in awe of something, you are dumbstruck. And again, that doesn't sound like something you would want someone to say of you. But if it's in considering the greatness of God, I am dumbstruck. I cannot begin to fathom His goodness and His greatness and His love. It is beyond me. I'm in awe of Him. I fear Him. And so when we're talking about the condition of our heart, one of the things that we need to have in our heart is a healthy fear. That's what we need to have in our hearts. As we consider this, we look at some of the things that we've already read and we've already heard today as well. There needs to be a deferential respect. 
we defer to. Many of us struggle with that. Sounds simple enough, we defer to God. But there are a number of us, sometimes self-included, who do not. Sometimes I defer to me. Because I know what's best for me. I know what I need. And I tend to not always defer. And so while it may sound simple, it's something that actually takes practice and takes effort. And it has to be something that's intentional. Obeisance. There's a big word that I've never used before. Anyone here ever use that word? Obeisance? That's okay. Uh, like I said, I've never used it before either. I thought, well, let's sound smart today. Let's throw out some big words. So I, I'm throwing out to you obeisance. Obeisance is a word that means that you have such a great respect that you are almost in the position of bowing down. Um, that's kind of the condition that our heart should be in. That's why I actually chose to use this word, not to make myself sound smart, uh, because it actually really fits pretty well. This idea of obeisance, that is to be our heart condition as we come to worship. So as we come to worship, those are the qualities, those are the things that need to be in our heart as we approach Him. Those are the things that need to be there. And, you know, this is an every time. This isn't a, you know, I'm going to come to church today and I'm just going to take it off today. I'm not really going to be in the worship kind of thing here today. i got other stuff on my mind. You know, i got these messages I need to respond to. i got this, i got that. And we'd be surprised with what we see up here. And we know. Some of you are elsewhere. That's not my business. It's really not. That's between you and the one that you have come here to worship. Right? So, I'm not going to dwell on that. I didn't invite anyone to bring their steel toe shoes. I shall be alone. But it is in every time we are here. That takes work. That takes intention. So that first thing was we need to worship Him in Spirit. The second thing is that we worship Him in truth. We worship Him in truth. And the most important takeaway from this is the idea that we worship the one true God through Jesus. We worship the one true God through Jesus. This is ultimate truth. And this is really, really, really easily backed up. A verse that many of you are probably quite familiar with it comes out of the Gospel of John, chapter 14, verse 6. And Jesus said to him, I am the way, the truth, and the life. I am the way, the truth, and the life. We must worship him, not only in spirit, but we worship him in truth. There really can't be if we're coming together to worship. There can't really be any question of who it is that we're worshiping. There really can't. Because if you have those doubts, then how can you actually come with the right heart? How can you have the right approach? And what are you worshiping if not this truth? Then? And so these are not negotiable. And if you remember back in the passage from John that we read, it says, this is what must. I don't know if you guys caught that word before. There was a must in there. This is what we must have for worship. Worship in spirit and worship in truth. Not negotiable. That is where we start. And if you aren't there, then your heart isn't right for worship. And we need to fix that. So, who we worship and how we worship matter. So, I said, how do we do this this side of the cross? And that's because, you know, things are different before and after the cross. Worship was different before the cross as well. Uh, there are some things, however, that we can take with us. But there are some things that we have left behind when it comes to worship as well. We do not worship today with the same 
need for precise ritual. Did ritual matter in Old Testament worship? It very much did, right? If I were to uh, be in the place where we're doing the Lord's Supper, so uh, Pastor Jay and I usually are the ones that are up here administering that, and there was one time that I did that, I completely forgot what I was supposed to do. I just blanked out, and normally I talked about the bread, and I didn't talk about the wine, and actually this was when Pastor Cole was here. I, I just completely did the exact opposite thing. So let me ask you a question, because I did that wrong. Was our worship ruined? No, it wasn't. I mean, I, I felt about that tall. But our worship wasn't ruined because we do not hinge on a precise need or exact ritual. They carried out in a very specific way, but they did in the Old Testament. We don't live under that right now. And a really good thing, this, this is really good, we don't worship today with the same need for blood sacrifice. Personally, I'm happy about that unless we're talking about some steak afterward, and that kind of didn't happen either, did it? So, we don't do those things, but I do want to tell you that there are some things that we can go back to the Old Testament about worship and find how they do kind of cross that barrier, that Old Testament, New Testament time. Even before the words of Jesus, David, of course, right? David understood the importance of worshiping in spirit and in truth. Consider this from Psalm 86, verses 11 and 12. Teach me your way, O Lord. I will walk in your truth. Unite my heart to fear your name. I will praise you, O Lord my God, with all my heart. And I will glorify your name Evermore. So this is from David, and this is before Jesus walked the earth and spoke the words that he spoke to us about worship earlier. Do you see the parallel? Do you see the connection with worship here from that Old Testament time of David to what Jesus himself said? Unite my heart to fear your name. Fear. We just kind of already talked about that, didn't we? It's that same deep reverence. And I want you to notice something else here. In what David's words were here, where does that fear come from? Unite my heart. And isn't that the notion of spirit? And isn't that part of our right approach to worship? Unite. Unite my heart to fear your name. David knew and understood the ways of the Lord. He also understood the ideas of truth. These inward things, his heart and his knowing the truth, led to an outward act of worship. Teach me your way, O Lord. I will walk in your truth. How are we to worship? In spirit? truth. And David has this laid out for us already. Those things led to his outward expression of worship. I will praise you, O Lord my God, with all my heart, and I will glorify your name forevermore. That's pretty awesome. That's some pretty good stuff. But that's David. That's David, right? That's David, and that is David's heart. And it's great for him, but what does it have to do then with us? with me, right here, right now, with you, right here, right now, as we sit in the pews, the covenant. What it does have to do with is making sure that we understand this basic thing about worship, about what worship is, what postaneo means as an individual, but also as we engage in corporate worship as well. It means that as you come in today, your heart is ready. It means that as you come in today, you hold up and stand on the truth. 
Let's get a little bit more ground level and look at what that might look like in a worship service. Kind of where we are, yes? So let's kind of take some, some looks at what that might look at. Uh, we're, of course, going to stay in Scripture to try to figure this out. Uh, we're going to jump around a little bit. So as we come together to worship corporately, what do we have to do? Well, that's kind of an interesting thing. What do we have to do? Because is there a laid out set liturgy? Is there a you must, you must, you must, and you must? And if you check those boxes, you got a worship service. Yes? It's not like that. So there is no requirement that a service has to have certain particular elements. There are several elements, there are several items that can make up a worship service. Um, you could have a worship service that's just one thing. I was talking, I don't even remember who I was talking to, but I was talking to somebody probably in one accord that, hey, we need to have another song service. And in the song services we've had in the past, guess what we do? Sing. Sing. Yeah. No preacher, no preaching. Not that our preacher's bad. But do you have to have preaching for a worship service? You do not. All right? So what are some of these elements? What are some of these things that we can have in a worship service? One that we want to start with is really a good one to start with. And I'm not going to tell you that it has to be in there, but it would be surprising if it were not. And so maybe, maybe the first one, a good one for us to start with, is prayer. Prayer. So most of you know the verse right there in front of you. Uh, first Thessalonians 5, 17, pray without ceasing. Pray without ceasing. Uh, how many of you have that one memorized? <laughs> good job. All right. Working hard. So listen, the context of that verse is this idea that we do not know when the Lord will return. And when he does, what would it be awesome if we were doing? It'd be kind of cool, wouldn't it? Right? It would be awesome if we were praying. We are to be praying without ceasing. Um, and so, what should we do in a worship service? I don't know. Pray. Right? Kind of seems like a really good fit into a worship service. Um, it is something that we find in Scripture. Listen, prayer is direct communion or communication with God through Jesus. You, this is, this is amazing, you have direct access to God. You do. You have direct access to Him. You know, I can't even get home of the Secretary of State right now. But I got access to God. Who would you rather talk to? Right? And you have access to Him. We have direct access to God. So, the thing about prayer is that we're in this setting. It's a little bit different than when you, by yourself, are in your prayer closet. So it looks a little bit different than there. Um, a model that, of prayer that I like to use with the youth group, um, I teach this to them, is the ACTS model of prayer. Um, each of those letters stands for a component of prayer that I think is a really good way to help people if they struggle with prayer. A stands for adoration. As we begin our prayer, it should begin with adoration of God, acknowledgement of His greatness, acknowledgement of who He is. The C in Acts stands for confession. For as great as he is, I am low. For as good as he is, I am not. And if I am going to have that direct communication of God, I need to be right. I need to get to a place where he wants to hear from me. And I need to come before him in my prayer closet and get on my knees and say, Father, forgive me. of God. We adore who He is. We come before Him and we acknowledge who we are. We ask His forgiveness. 
the tea is for Thanksgiving. Because I don't know about you, but I am way blessed. <laughs> I am way blessed. I mean, if you really want to spend some time here, I could actually sit down and start throwing my blessings with you. I could. I'm way blessed. God has been so good to me. And I'll bet if we took the time, you could tell me how good he's been to you too. Way blessed. And so when we go to God, when we commune with him, when we talk with him, we need to acknowledge who he is. We need to acknowledge who we are. We need to thank him for what he's done. And then at the end, the last part of this, the S is supplication. We have need. We have things that happen in our lives that are, we acknowledge it beyond our control. And we say, Father God, I can't, but you can. That is a model for prayer that I try to go over with my youth group. It's a beautiful way to keep your prayer life to the point where we are able to not lose sight of why we're talking to him. I have fallen many times for the habit of, dear God, listen, things are really bad right now, and I need this, and I need this, and I need this, and thanks a lot, amen. So how does that look here? Because it's going to look a little bit different, right? I don't think that as a church, I don't think that as a church, maybe that C part is necessarily, I guess maybe you can see that right, right? That C part really isn't something that we need to all, okay, guys, here you go. Lay it out there. Let's hear it. Right? That's, that's not the corporate part of it. That's the individual part of it. But when we come together as a church, we can still have the adoration. We can still have the thanksgiving. We can still have supplication. This church has been blessed. This church has needs. This church has people with needs. And as a church, one of the things that we should be doing is praying the needs of people in this church. Yes? So, prayer is a, a vital of any type of worship service that we're going to be involved in. One that some people struggle with. Um, the next one that I want to say, the next item we can have in a worship service is singing. Singing. So you see a verse right there, Psalm 100, uh, verses 1 and 2. This is a verse that, or actually a whole song that we did in our Facebook Live. Um, it says, make a joyful shout to the Lord, all you lands, and serve the Lord with gladness. Come before his presence with singing. Come before his presence with singing. So I did a word search on this just to make sure, and you know what it did not say? Come before the Lord with grumbling. It's not, it's not in there. It's singing. And it doesn't say, make a joyful whisper to the Lord. What does it say? Out. One of the things in the Facebook Live thing that I challenge people to do when we're uh, stuck at home all those times was to go outside and give an actual shout to the Lord. I was really nervous when I did that. I'm like, I'm going to say that. I need to do it myself. I'm like, man, what's going to happen? I did it. And after I did it, I'm like, well, it actually wasn't so bad. Um, but what are we to do here? Listen, it says, come before his presence. We are in his house, are we not? Which means we are in his presence, are we not? And we are with his people, are we not? Should that not cause a reaction with you and I that we should then come before his presence with singing? As we continue on, there's a couple of other verses I'm going to share with you. Um, I didn't put this one out on the screen because I've only got so much room. Uh, so remember I said you can search the scriptures yourself. I'm going to save this one for you, but you can open up your own Bibles or write it down and check it at home. Let the word of Christ dwell in you richly in all wisdom, 
teaching and admonishing one another in psalms and hymns and spiritual songs, singing with grace in your hearts to the Lord. So one of the things that I want us to understand about our singing is we can't just come in here and sing any old song. That's not it either. Our singing needs to be able to relate back to and support the truth of the Word of Christ. Let the Word of Christ dwell richly in you and all wisdom. And so we need for our music to be able to do that with us as well. And the last one I'll share with you on this is Ephesians 5.19. Speaking to one another in psalms and hymns and spiritual songs, singing and making a melody in your heart to the Lord. A couple things I want you guys to understand about that. Where does the singing originate? In your heart. Well, it originates in your voice, doesn't it? No, it doesn't. It originates in your heart. If it originated in your voices, we'd be in trouble. You'd be in trouble if you had to listen to me sing that way. So, listen. To whom are we singing? You're singing to the Lord. So let me tell you what that means you're not singing to. You're not singing to the person in the pew in front of you. You are not singing to that person. You are singing to the Lord God Almighty, the creator of heaven and earth, the one who knit you together and is the lover of your soul. Sing praises to him. Sing like you love him. Seem like you love him. God is not concerned with the quality of your voice, but with the quality of your heart in worshiping him. Think about that. Seem like you love him. So I want to keep moving on here. There's another thing that can be in our worship service. Uh, in addition to what we've talked about, there is also the idea of baptism. So baptism is part of a worship service. Now, do we have a baptism every Sunday? Unfortunately, we don't. It would be cool if we did, uh, but we don't. So looking at this, Acts chapter 2, verse 41, those who gladly received his word were baptized, and that day about 3,000 souls were added to them. Wow. What a day that would be, huh? <sighs> I, would, I would love that. I'd have to, we'd have to tag team back here trying to baptize people. Yes. I get all tired, but I, I would be okay with that. I would be willing to suffer through that. So what is baptism? It's that moment where one who is, one who is a born-again believer, publicly identifies with Jesus and his death, his burial, and his resurrection. That's what baptism is, right? It's this public acknowledgement of one who is already born again. We've just begun to celebrate baptism, celebrate, to study baptism in the youth group, actually. Uh, right when the shutdown hit, we were, I think, one about to start our second lesson in baptism. So we didn't get very far in it. Uh, but we were about to do that, uh, with the goal being that hopefully, having learned about it, it might cause some of our young people to have that desire to follow him in that. And we would have the opportunity then here to be able to come together and to worship for the baptism. So that's great. But most of we've talked about the one who, you know, goes on to right? What's it mean for you? We get to rejoice in that, absolutely, positively. Um, we rejoice in that um, because they gladly received his word. The other thing about it, guys, is when someone is baptized, usually the person who is doing a baptism will give an admonition to the church as well because this person has decided to publicly follow Christ. And the charge the church is not disciple them. Because if they're getting baptized, they're probably new in the faith. And if they're new in the faith, they probably need some help to grow in it. And so, church, we come together and we worship and we disciple. And we help them to grow in their faith. And so, one of the things that can be in a worship service is baptism. Now, I'm going to get to the part that you guys love the most. Are you ready? What else can be in a service? Preaching. Why that? Preaching and the reading scripture. Uh, it is your most favorite thing I know, uh, but um, you have no idea where I'm going to go with this, so you should just be really thankful here. Uh, just trust me. Now, before I get to there, I'm going to kind of go backwards a little bit. Uh, I'm going to look at James 
uh, 122. And if you're keeping score, this is the second uh, sermon in a row where I've landed on this verse. So I think God must be talking to somebody. Mm. Right? Uh, be you doers of the word and not hearers only, deceiving yourselves. Listen, for you all to be hearers, you need to be gathered to do so. Right? I mean, now we did have some technology issues where we were not gathered here, but you were still gathered, whether you were gathered at home watching online. Is that worship? Is that corporate worship? It's worship, but is it corporate worship? So we are gathered here. And one of the things that we gather here for is the word to have it preached to us. Um, this isn't anything new either. I mean, you have read many, many times in the Old Testament how they used to gather in the synagogues for preaching and teaching, correct? So this is not a new thing. This is not something that you've not heard before. Um, what we need to do then is, as someone is opening God's Word, what we need to do is have an understanding that this is His revelation to us. We need to humble ourselves as we listen to what it is that God has revealed to the speaker. Because listen, what he gave the speaker isn't necessarily for the speaker. It is for you. It is for us. Right? And so, as we sit, we need to understand that God is speaking through his word for us, to us. And so we should be listening. So I told you I was going to uh, let you know how good you have it. So, ask Chapter 20, verse 7. Now, on the first day of the week, the first day of the week, all right, when the disciples came together to break bread, Paul, ready to depart the next day, spoke to them and continued his message until I had 12 hours to go. I have a feeling that if some of you know the ending part of this passage, you know that it didn't necessarily mean that just because Paul was speaking till midnight, everyone was in the game. Uh, there was a dude who was sitting on the window. They were up on the third floor. And in this particular passage, the dude was like, uh, I've seen this on the pews before. And out he went. No, literally out he went. Not like he fell asleep out. He fell asleep and out the window he went. Went to the floor, died. What a way to go, huh? Now, it's not the story. As Paul did come and laid on top of me, came back. But like, how do you explain that to your friends? Yeah, I was, I was sleeping in the sermon and I fell out the window and died. They had to bring me back. I promise you, I'm not going to midnight. I won't even be close. I'm actually almost done. Okay, but this is a perfect verse for us because what's happening? Well, a message is being delivered. Kind of like right now. Kind of like every time you come here for a worship service. A message is being delivered. When is it happening? It is happening on the first day of the week. We call that day Sunday. Yes, here we are. It is the Lord's Day. It is Sunday. What are they coming together to do? Well, if we look at the passage, there's two things that they're coming to do here. Uh, they are coming together for two purposes, breaking bread and to hear a message. We'll come back to the breaking bread thing. I'm going to end with that, but let's do the message. Um, listen, what we need to understand is that, and, and it's hard because you're sitting here and now it's actually afternoon. You're like, man, pastor, you've done that now. This guy got to go. Um, it's a privilege. It's a privilege for us to be able to hear what God has given someone else to share with you. Because what I need you to understand when I say that is while you're sitting here, you maybe half believe what I just said. There are people in other parts of this world who risk their life to hear someone preach God's message understand that. There are people who when they go to a worship service, they run the risk of authorities finding out and ending them. This is a privilege that we enjoy. And it's something that we need to understand. Listen, God has tailored a message that is needed, and He has chosen the vessel to deliver it to you. Today it happens to be me. It's not normal in me. It's usually Pastor Jay. So listen, then are you excited about what it is when you come into a service? What has God got for me today? I struggle with that sometimes. But that's really what it is. 
What does God have for me today? Because listen, you're here by divine appointment. So what does God have for you? We should be excited. All right, what is going to be opened up out of God's word? What is going to be shared for me today? Listen, this is for you, right? Because you are sitting here, and this is the message that God has ordained for this day for this people. This is for you. So we should be excited about what it is that God has for you. And listen, next Sunday, get this. He's going to have another message for you. Only for you. Because that's how special you are. Because that's how much God loves you. It's a pretty amazing thing. So I'm going to move on to get to that last thing we're going to talk about today. It can be in a worship service. And that last thing is the Lord's table. And the reason I saved this one for last is because this is one of those things that can be both corporate, us together, and an individual time of worship. And you might be thinking, well, individual, we always do communion as well. That's true, so bear with me, okay? Um, as we look at that passage, on the first day of the week, when the disciples came together to break bread, it says they came together to break bread. So why did they come together? Break bread, right? They came together for this purpose to break bread. He died, Jesus died. He sacrificed himself for his bride, his love, the church. He did that for us. When he instituted the Lord's table, he was gathered with his disciples. They were together. Uh, and you can find more of this in Matthew chapter 26. Um, it's a passage that probably you're familiar with. It's often repeated when we celebrate the Lord's table. Instead, I'm going to take us someplace else. We're going to be looking at 1 Corinthians 11, 23 through 26. But you need some context of the verses that are right before that. So starting back in verse 17, Paul is chastising the Corinthian church for their behavior during this part of worship. <coughs> they, ooh, listen, this is bad. They have divisions among them. And Paul is calling them out on this. They have divisions, and the body needs to be one in unity. We actually heard David talk about that earlier in worship, didn't we? And here we are in a worship service where we're celebrating the Lord's table. They were not actually partaking together. They would partake individually, some here at their own time, some over here at their own time. And there was not a unity of the body in partaking in this. And Paul is admonishing them. He's letting them know that this is not right, that there is a corporate a church together aspect of the Lord's table. Uh, in verses 23 through 26, For I received from the Lord that which I also delivered to you, that the Lord Jesus, on the same night in which he was betrayed, took bread. And when he had given thanks, he broke it and said, Take, eat, this is my body, which is broken for you. Do this in remembrance of me. In the same manner, he also took the cup after supper, saying, This cup is the new covenant of my blood. This do as often as you drink it in remembrance of me. For as often as you eat this bread and drink this cup, you proclaim the Lord's death until he comes. This is what we do corporately. But listen, there's a part of this that is individual as well. Verses 27 through 29 deal with the individual part of this. Therefore, whoever eats this bread or drinks this cup of the Lord in an unworthy manner will be guilty of the body and blood of the Lord. Man, that passage, it scares me. That is a scary passage. Whoever eats this bread or drinks this cup in worthy, unworthy manner will be guilty of the body and blood of the Lord. Verse 28 says, But let a man examine himself, and so let him eat of the bread and drink of the cup. For he eats and drinks is Drinks in an unworthy manner, eats and brings judgment to himself, not concerning the word of God. So this is the individual part of it. We have an individual responsibility to examine ourselves in light of what it is that God expects of us and what it is that he has done for us. That is an individual thing and is not a corporate thing. Listen, he died for you. He defeated death for you. He rose again. He died for us as a church. We are individuals that come together and worship corporately. We come together to break bread. And all of that then takes us full circle. It takes us to the point where we get back to the question, why are you here? Why are you here? Are you here for true worship? Are you here for false worship? 
It's a, it's a tough question, but it's a really, really important one. This is not a one Sunday message. You know? A lot of times you get a message on like, it's like a topic and a little bit of topic and it's great and you go home and you get another one. This one's a little bit different because this is an every Sunday message. Every time that you come here together with God's people, we need to be looking at these things. We need to be looking at our heart. We need to see if our spirit is in the right place and we need to be worshiping him in truth. So, how is your heart? How's your spirit? Are we worshiping the truth? Let's pray. Heavenly Father, we thank you for today. We thank you, Father, for what is a privilege to be able to be in your house. We thank you, Father, that we have an opportunity to hear your word. But, Father, we have an opportunity to come before you and rejoice and shout before you and sing and make a melody for our heart. God, I pray that as we go from this place, you will let your words resonate in our hearts. That, Father, we might have a true spirit of worship when we come back again. We ask this in Jesus' name.